Hi, good evening. I am David Amponsa, Assistant Professor of African Studies um, here at the University of Pennsylvania. And I'm happy to introduce Dr. Sahida Darinto. Professor Sahida Darinto and his BA from the University of Ibadan, Nigeria in 2004, and a PhD from the University of Texas at Austin in 2010. He recently completed a book manuscript, An Humanity and Colonial Subject to in Africa, the Human and Non-Human Creatures of Colonial Nigeria, uh, from which this talk is based. And then he has also published seven books, including Guns and Society in Colonial Nigeria, Firearms, Culture, and Public Order, Indian University Press 2018, and When Sex Threatened the State, Illicit Sexuality, Nationalism, and Politics in Colonial Nigeria, also from the University of Illinois um, in 2015. He is the founding president of the Lagos Studies Association. He sits on the editorial board of nine international journals and a member of the College of Senior Academic Mentors of Codestra's African Diaspora Support to African Universities program. The title of his talk today is The City is Beyond Human, In Search of Animals in African Urban Studies. Please join me in welcoming <coughs> Dr. Sahid Adirinto. I would like to thank Dr. David Amposa for inviting me and for that great introduction. Uh, when African urban studies began several decades ago, scholars argued that colonialism did not introduce urbanization to Africa. They countered the Eurocentric conception of series as exclusive preserves of Western European civilization. Uh, drawing evidence from archaeology, from material culture, and even oral traditions, including the ones that praised African elites for converting wastelands and forests into built environment and series. So you hear some adorations like Obatosogodile, Tosogbediguru, Tosatodileoja, Otumasoyaraman, the Kameri Dilugu. Yet, Colonialism introduced new patterns of urbanization to Africa, either by building on pre-existing series or creating brand new ones. And in no period in Nigeria's urban history did this become obvious than the 1950s royal visit by Queen Elizabeth II, a magnificent spectacle of imperial power that consumed an estimated two million pounds worth of Nigeria's money. Nigerians gave the queen what she came to see. You know, city civilization, urban modernity. The so-called positive gaze of a century of ruthless capitalist expropriation that manifested in tarred roads, hospitals, electricity, hygienically looking school children waving the Union Jack a show of solidarity and loyalty amongst other carefully created sites and symbols of imperial modernity. However, the city in Africa is more than human. Some of the biggest debates about urban planning and aesthetics of everyday life in the city have historically been shaped by humans' contradictory impression of the material as well as the symbolic values of a wide range of animal species. The dialectics of clean and dirty, ugly and beautiful, loyal and rebellious, domestic and wild animals have all been informed by how humans would like to enjoy urban modernities. From public health and pollution consideration that galvanized into slum clearance scheme, extermination of rats, and urban livestock keeping legislation, to how dog fencing defined racial and class hierarchies in urban centers. The stories of city animals should be of interest to horse scholars. Europeans who criticize fellow Europeans over the shooting of beautiful and harmless birds relied on the modernist framing of the animal as one of the beauties of urban skylines and landscape. They rarely spoke for the cat 
in such manner because of its ambivalent styles as an animal that struggled the thin line between the tame world and the wild world. The same applied to multiple forms of animal species. So dogs remain the most beloved urban animals until the outbreak of rabies, when a single legislation known as the Dogs Ordinance placed their survivor in the hands of instant death. The central argument of this lecture is that animals have escaped the purview of urban study scholars because of the anthropocentric or the humanocentric or the human-centered conception of history and of agency. And in order to address this epistemological deficiency, we need to rethink the circumstances under which animals can be object, subject, and agent of historical interpretation. It is a truism that animals did not write about themselves in the past. They didn't. However, they took independent actions that formed the basis of major turning points in human history. And this itself represents a form of agency that scholars should not overlook. So one of the things I'm going to try to do today, <coughs> essentially, is to use the story of urban dogs to engage with the intersections of animality and urbanity. And the reason I'm using the story of dogs can be best understood within the context of transcultural <laughs> understanding of the place of dogs in human history. We all know that across cultures, dogs are historically humans' most intimate friends or companions. And for many reasons that I will try to explain from the perspective of the experience of Lagos today, animals were also one of the signals of urbanity. They were the most beloved urban animals. People just love them because they are urban animals. The territorial consciousness of dogs actually worked very well with the concept of urbanity and urban planning. In other words, because dogs have a territorial consciousness, it also shaped the ways in which humans tried to plan the lives of dogs so that they can align with lives of humans. So in other words, the story I'm about to talk to today is not just about what happened to dogs in colonial Lagos, it's about what, why humans believe that they can shape the lives of dogs to meet their own understanding of the symbolism and materiality of animal life itself. <coughs> At the same time, the breeds of dogs shaped by um, their ancestry also aligned perfectly with humans framing of what is right and what is wrong. Different breeds of dogs, their origin, their sociality shaped social and racial hierarchies. Again, we're going to talk extensively about that. I'm just trying to lay the foundation of the talk itself. Dogs were also used to police racial boundaries. One of the most controversial law um, uh, case in colonial Lagos took place in 1954 over the biting of an African by a dog of a European. This we see in other series across the world. But in colonial sites, where dogs, dog security or the relationship between dogs and colonial resistance <coughs> takes a unique dimension that I think scholars should take seriously. Another thing we need to understand about dogs is that we're actually proxies. You know, for human identities, right? Uh, humans absorbed the role of dogs. Dogs absorbed the identity of their owners. So that whatever you say to someone's dog automatically translates to the individual. And that is why dogs, again, are the animals that helps us to understand what it takes for people to live in, in colonial series during the first half of the 20th century. And I'm also going to make some argument that some of my colleagues have found really very provocative, and I'm happy that it's provocative. Uh, the argument is to look at the ways in which dogs can actually be colonial subjects. Not just dogs. One of the central arguments of my book is that animals were colonial subjects. For the first time, we see a book that is putting animals at the center of coloniality itself, or colonialism, if you would like. And so <clears throat> the last point <coughs> that is going to form the basis of the discussion is the capacity to see 
animals as um, colonial subjects, to look at how the identities of their owner, even their own behavior as a non-human creature, translates to some forms of not only agency and of course subjectivity. In other words, when we look at the typical life of an African dog, whether it's an African dog or a colonialist dog, we see some of the element of what it takes to live in a colonial subject. The contradictions, the ambivalences, the opportunities, the limitations, the minuses, and of course the plus. Um, because I don't assume that everyone here knows Lagos, I will just do a kind of a short overview of the place. Uh, it came into existence like most African cities in the pre-colonial times. It was not really a big place because it was an island, the, you know, sparsely populated, nothing was actually going on comparatively to other Yoruba towns. So uh, when Lagos was in the 15th, 16th, 17th century it was a small fishing community, not as powerful as big Yoruba towns like Ife or like Oyo. But according to Christy Mann, we know what transpired later with uh, slave to the slavery transforming Lagos from a fishing community into a slave, uh, a major slave port of West Africa coast. And these, of course, would lead to significant transformation, not only in the Atlantic network of relations that was going on, but of course in the politics of the town itself. By the 1850s, the politics over buying and selling of humans became so intense that Europeans, the British, for the first time got involved. And the involvement of the British ushered in the introduction or the beginning of colonialism in Lagos. So Lagos became the first part of Nigeria to be colonized, effectively, from around 1861. And um, of course, during the period, <coughs> it was the most racially diverse and ethnically diverse. Because as a coastal community, um, as the gateway to the international world, Lagos was serving a lot of economic importance. And this economic importance <coughs> was driving a lot of people to Lagos. <coughs> During the colonial and the post-colonial period, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> so during the colonial and the post-colonial period, Lagos was the epicenter of Nigerian popular culture. But in the colonial period, it was not even the most populous, popular city in, in, in Nigeria. It was around a quarter of a million, around 1950. It was, but it was actually bigger than Lagos in the colonial period. So the rise of Lagos as Nigeria's most populous city, and Africa's most populous city, was a post-1960 development. Today, no one can tell in absolute terms how many people live in Lagos, but what we know is that at least 10 million people live in Lagos. Uh, and so I'm going to show you some, a couple of photos. Uh, this is uh, Nigeria. Africa and Nigeria, then of course Lagos over here, coastal. Location matters in everything, in the development of civilization, in the kind of external contact and the makeup of cultural identities. And it is easy to know why Lagos was going to be the most important city in Nigeria, the coastal part of Nigeria, because of the gateway to the international world. Some old photos of Lagos, um, you know, modern Lagos today. Um, and this is a colonial. Uh, um, uh, map. Uh, this map is important for some of the conversations we're going to be having later. Um, this plastic part is going to be the old indigenous Lagos, quote unquote. This is the map of Lagos Island, not the Lagos that we know today. The Lagos we know today is massive in terms of the last part. And uh, this, we're going to talk about this place a lot. Um, it was Europeans' only neighborhood came, coming into existence in the first decade of the 20th century as a result of the notion that in order to deal with malaria, uh, Europeans should run away from African communities. Uh, we're gonna, we have time to talk about it. So this took the Ikoi and Victoria Island. And of course, um, uh, some uh, uh, business district, but most of the indigenous people of Lagos live here. So what I'm going to be talking about later is why the lives of dogs in these communities, in these communities around this area, shape the ways those who have power, the colonial secretary, shape the ways they think they should organize the city. When you organize the city, you organize humans. And when you organize humans' best friend, you also organize non-human creatures. There's a network of relations or, ne or relationship between the ways the city organizes its physical infrastructures and, of course, human infra infrastructures. Uh, old, uh, old photos of Lagos. I don't know if you can see. I think this guy <coughs> should be a dog or a cat. I'm not really very sure, but it's not too obvious. Um, old district of Lagos. These photos are from... Uh, Akima Bogunje's urbanization in, in Nigeria, 
and um, I don't know, this guy is probably a, a goat, I'm not very, very sure. Of course, uh, other neighborhoods in the, in the, in the, in the old Lagos, then, you know, some other parts of Lagos include uh, places like Moshi, uh, Sandra Bins is there, she wrote a book on, on Moshi in Lagos. So, but these are just the areas, the, 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 the Lagos and I said, and this is an old photo of uh, Ikoyi, uh, Suru Leri and so Good. So let me first introduce the first dogs. Uh, in the pre-colonial period, the first dogs of Lagos were the pre-colonial dogs. And these were utility dogs. They were everything. They, were, they did everything. They were companions. They were hunters. They were guards. They were also sacrificial deities. Um, dogs help uh, different religious identities to navigate the spiritual and the physical world. And um, uh, for, for example, the Yoruba god of Ogun, the god of, uh, the, the god of uh, intrepidity, of warfare, of high, or dog is one of the paraphernalia of worshiping the, the, the god. So the pre-colonial god, the dog, was a utility dog in a nutshell. It was, it was a means, a, you know, a currency and a means of exchange. What it means is that it can be part of <coughs> commercial transaction. It can be used for bright price. It can be used for social and economic transaction. Sacrificial, the it was an efficient guy. So the, the reason we have to talk about the pre-colonial dog is that by the 20th century, a new form of dog fencing emerged, not only amongst Europeans who came to Nigeria, but also among Africans, the concept of a pet dog. And that is why the story of the pre-colonial dog is important in understanding how and why the pet dog emerged. So we should, we should expect the pre-colonial dog to live the life of pre-colonial people. Right in terms of their cultural formations, economic formations, you know, and everything they did to humans made them essentially a utility dog, a dog that does everything. Now, so this guy is a colonialist dog. Um, one thing we need to understand about colonialism is that it was not just about human conquest. Dogs were co-agents of imperialism. Um, dogs were the, the second largest non-human creature that went to any colony. And this is one aspect of African colonial encounter that has not been seriously engaged. Even Frederick Lugard, the so-called founder of the Nigerian state, came to Nigeria with a dog. It was difficult for colonial officers to come with their wives at the beginning of the of colonial enterprise, but it was not difficult for them to bring dogs. And it appeared that colonialism directly fueled the importation of European dogs because of the decision not to allow whites to come with colonial masters. So Nigeria used to be called a no place for women until the 1930s or 40s. So there's a way to argue that because colonialism did not encourage early colonial officers to bring their wives, it indirectly fueled the inroad of European dogs. The dogs we're talking about were of different breeds, uh, you know, different breeds, uh, Spaniards, Yorkia, Terrier, Irish Terrier, different breeds. And they were defined as pet dogs. Why? Because of the notion that they don't have a job. And this is fundamental in many parts of the book, the several parts of the things I wrote in the book. The idea of a quote unquote lap dog, yacht dog, parlor dog, some of them were small, like this guy, that don't think this guy can be used for hunting. <laughs> because some of them were so, I mean, just like asking, uh, what's the name of this small dog uh, <coughs> that people have now? Uh, Chihuahua. Chihuahua. Yeah, I mean, no one is going to hunt with Chihuahua. So I don't know if anyone's going to do that. So, so, so most of them were, but they are coming into Africa, diversified the African dog population, genetically and socially, through crossbreeding. We can say with absolute confidence, uh, with some level of um, with some level of certainty, that the pre-colonial dog diversity was not much. But this kind of dogs came in and through crossbreeding, and we know why crossbreeding was inevitable. Some of the dogs that that came from Europe were male dogs, some of them were female dogs, and for them to continue the lineage, they would need African dogs to to mate. So they lived with their masters in segregated neighborhoods and they are zoom and enjoy all the privileges of being the dogs of colonial masters. Now, the term colonialist dog is not, a, not, it's not just about the breed of the dogs. 
is actually about ownership. In other words, if a colonial officer owns an African local dog, that dog automatically assumes all the privileges and identity of the master. And the same applies if this exotic dog is owned by an African, all the privileges this dog would have as an adult dog would automatically go because the ownership matters a lot. So the question about this dichotomy between the pet dog and the utility dog, which is, which is an important element of urbanity, it only happens in the theory, this dichotomy. And of course, the fluidity is what we're going to be talking about shortly too. <clears throat> so they were part of the dressing. They were part of the dressing of colonial order. I mean, in most of the colonial photos, you see dogs more than women. And that's just really how colonialism conceived of power. On the one hand, most of the colonial officers were actually men. Most of them were not in, don't have their wives or partners in Nigeria. The few ones that had their partners in Nigeria, they did not integrate their wives into the main infrastructure of power until the 40s when things were changing. So you probably, in the early photos of 1910s, 20s, and 30s, the chances that you're going to see dogs with male with male officers were more than even women because of the fact that colonialism was a male-centered edifice. It was created by men and, of course, expected to be run by men. So these are early, uh, this photo is the photo of uh, Walter Egerton, one of the early colonial officers in Lagos, and I think we have three dogs. One, two, three. The argument I made is that these dogs were not in this photo by accident. Their presence and image in these photos were part of the dressing of colonial power. And the same applies to this one. They have the right to share the space with their officers. And this under one, these I think they should be one. Maybe the under one hiding somewhere. All these photos I got them from the National Archive of the United Kingdom uh, two summers ago. And under one, the, 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 the caption on this photo is actually interesting. Mm -hmm. Uh, the caption is that he's helping the master to listen to the gramophone, something like that. Sharing the, you know, power with, with dogs. And of course, the same guy with his dog, they're having, actually having breakfast. So these are the issues, you know. So I have more photos of pet dogs than, than, uh, than utility dogs. And we know why. The reason is because photography, colonial photography itself was a class thing. Those who have power are the only ones who show a lot in it. <clears throat> so something happened to the dogs of Africans. When I say Africans dog, I'm talking about dogs owned by Africans at this point. And like I said they can be of different breeds. So the, 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 this breed becomes a more, becoming more and more diverse. And the diversity is again because of the crossbreed that was going on. The population increased. Um, series all over the world are known for their unique form of crime. Different places, different crimes. And uh, there was an increase in the use of dogs for, for community policing. And uh, so there was increase in dog ownership in the city in response to unique crime taking place in the city. And uh, again, um, Sunday Brands did the same thing again in her book. She actually referenced the time in which at Moshi, the hunters were fighting the government and say, you can't impose taxes on adults because our dogs are helping us to police this, this, the community. What you cannot do, our dogs are doing it, so you can't tax our dogs. Because there was a time there was that dog taxation and uh, people were fighting, uh, actually fighting against, uh, against this. So and they, they continued to serve the purposes for which they were known in the pre-colonial times. In other words, the African dogs were still sacrificial animals, they were still used in sacrifice. To, for the gods, they were still companions, they were still so many things. What actually happened with the city, with the rise of Lagos in, into an urban center, is the expansion of their roles. And this is again when the whole idea of the pet dog emerged. Some educated Africans began to see keeping pet dog as one of the signals of what it takes to be an elite. They began to copy European colonial officers and expatriates who had pet dogs. They began to have what we can call lap dogs, their dogs. And what we have here is actually a story of a guy who took his dog to the cinema. The argument I made in the book was that people believed that their pet dog deserved to enjoy part of the paraphernalia of colonial modernity. And so the, so the 
So to have a pet dog, it's not just to have a dog that is disconnected from your life. Everything that happens to you must happen to the dog. And at this point in time, the artificial boundary between pet and utility dog was getting blood. It was getting blood. At the end of the day, so the so-called utility dog were gradually being shaped to become pet dogs. And all this were going on within the context of urban planning, which we're going to see more when we get to the story of rabies, which is one of the diseases of the time. So this is a photo of an African elite with these massive dogs. You know, that's one of the things that you, that you see. Ideally, the notions of urban planning was meant to keep people where they're supposed to be. African neighborhoods, European neighborhoods, different neighborhoods based on the level of facilities, equipment, levels of degeneration. Uh, Lagos had its own slums. And in colonial Lagos, the tension over, over urban planning was also about clearance of, storm, uh, of slums, fighting the government all the time. But dogs would rarely respect those demarcations. Dogs would socialize. They would be found in places that the government don't want them to be. And when this happened, they would place social power in relations with economic power because of the fact that dog breeding was an economic activity. So one of the important elements of urban planning was that dogs did not respect urban planning. And because dogs would not respect urban planning, it was creating tension between the colonial government and, of course, the, the, the colonized people. They would do that. And the idea of stray dog emerged. And what I like to say is that there's not like a stray dog. I always like to say that. The reason is because it's about power to shape why you exist at a place, at a particular point in time. Uh, colonialism is about altering people's physical presence. Are you supposed to be there? Are you not supposed to be there at every point in time? So the notion of stray dog is actually, you know, within the context of colonialism, is a way through which humans extended the legitimacy to be physically present at a space because of their body, because of the economic role they serve at every point in time. So the notion of street dogs is derogatory. Uh, it's derogatory because of the fact that it was looking at dog identity from the perspective of colonialists on the standard of dog's body. You should be in the parlor. You should be in the yard. Well, close yard. But dogs are not meant to be that. They're supposed to socialize. The pre-colonial dog, it cannot be a street dog because the dog plays around, socializes around. So the idea of a street dog was an important language of control, not only for the dog, but for the human. Because when a dog is captured, then the human, the owner had to regain the dog, right? And the whole idea of taking your dog back from the government's um, uh, detention area, then places women at the center of economic relations, because you have to fight it. And of course, legal, because it's illegal. So one of the things we need to understand about the intersection of urbanity, urbanization, and dog is the is so called the whole idea of the street dog. No dog is a street dog per se. Who constructed so the idea of the street dog that the dog the street is the government street. Because in the city those streets were not just constructed for people, they were constructed as insignias of what? Of colonial power, beauty, modernity. And the presence of so called pie dogs, mangy looking dogs, a lot of derogatory vocabulary used in describing African dogs. Their physical presence itself was seen as a dent to colonial street modernity, urban modernity. That was why on the eve of the Queen's visit in 1956, dogs all over the big cities where she was supposed to visit, Ibadan, Lagos, Kaduna, Enugu were killed a day before she came. Street dogs. That is how I actually started the book manuscript with that story, the dog massacre of 1956. A way to look at why the dogs have to be street dogs anyway. And, and so the question of street and street is important for looking at urbanization itself. The question of body, the question of presence. And again, the question of backing. Uh, so why do we have problem with dog noise? It's about neighborhood problem. Uh, Africans kept their dogs so that they can back and tell them that a thief is about to invade their home. Again, cities have a uniform of criminality. In Lagos, after the Second World War, crime rate increased exponentially. There's a long story to why this happened, and has been well documented by scholars. I would not like to go into it. Also, people were holding dogs, and it's not most 
so-called pet dogs will always want one or two. Africans don't own one, two dogs. A typical household can have five. If you have a house of 20 rooms, you can be sure that maybe each household would have a dog, minimum. You're talking about 12, 20 dogs per house. This would not happen in European neighborhood because a massive big house can actually belong not only to an African educated elite who are allowed to live in the neighborhood from the 1950s, but even to Europeans. The maximum dog a typical European would have is probably three. But a typical house in Africa, in, in Lagos, could actually have 20. The implication of this is that in looking at the, the so-called invasion of dogs into settled communities, both the colonial officers and even African elites, one of the things we need to understand about the stories of animals, it was not just about colonial power. It was also an elite power. Lagos had a large population of Africans who subscribed and believed in some of the ideas and notions of urban serenity and urban orderliness. And the medical officer of health at this point in time, in the 1940s and 50s, was actually an African, Dr. Luwale, and much of the debates about rabies came from me. So another thing we need to have in mind when we talk about the question of class, race, and power in, 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 in terms of urbanity. So the point I'm, where I'm going, when we're talking about the question of backing of dogs, we're looking at the relationship between different households, uh, neighborhoods, communities, how these dogs can actually travel up to 10 miles away from their owner's home to the European settlement. And how European settlement were thinking that they can stop Africans from coming to their own settlement, but they cannot stop dogs because dogs were much more mobile than humans. And this mobility is a function of their own physiological and, of course, multiple behavior. So the, the whole idea of noise in the city, that Lagos has become too noisy, is a product of the question of we need to deal with the dog population. And in order to deal with the dog population, we need to have dog taxes. Again, a long story in which the Gorilla government was thinking that they can impose taxes on dogs in order to stop Africans from breeding a lot of dogs. So that when you reduce the number of dog breeding, then you can have lesser noise in the city. There's a relationship between the notions of urban planning as a structural aspect of colonialism, humans as the makers of cities, and even animals who, who complement humans' life on a daily basis. So all dogs like humans were not uh, equal, and I think I tried to explain this, that it's not just about breed, uh, it's about ownership, it's about where they live, it's about community. And uh, rabies is one disease that consistently opened the, the situation for Africans and uh, Europeans of different identities, ideologies, on how to deal with what is considered to be a problem. Uh, hydrophobia is the disease of, uh, <coughs> of, uh, of, of rabies in human, and um, I would like to go through the entire medical problem. But it was a disease that challenged everything the government thought they could do about dogs. Uh, you can have a very good dog weighing 100 pounds, which, you know, costing about 200 pounds. But the dog cannot live on, on its own. So we have a lot of relationship going on within, with dogs. And dealing with rabies now become a way of shaping and trying to deal with human movement itself. And the, way, the best way to look at it is that even when a dog of Europeans have rabies, they have to kill their dogs. Because rabies is a disease that, unless you, have, unless you handle it very heavily. The implication is that rabies was preventing the growth of European dog, uh, of colonial, uh, uh, colonialist dog, at the same time preventing the proliferation of uh, African dogs. So rabies was an excuse to reduce the population of African dogs. And what normally happened about rabies regulation is that government will make a law and say that a particular part of the city is rabid, is, is rabid, that's the word, or is rabid infected, and that dogs cannot move in and out of that community. So if your dog is found in another place, the dog will be pounded and killed. To demonstrate the capacity to shape dog's life with urban planning. Dog, government would always allow rabies regulation to stay for a longer period in the Lagos, in the indigenous communities, in the densely populated Lagos island communities. But unfortunately, 
The idea that dogs will not move is not going to work because dogs were mobile. African dogs are not supposed to stay at home, they should be outside. And the movement of dogs during rabies will now give the government the opportunity not only to punish the owners for allowing their dogs to go out, but of course to also kill the dogs. And, and during this period, there was more and more tension, significant tension between the colonial government and Africa. Again, I would like to reiterate that in all this big narrative that I'm not going to be able to go into because of time, Africans of different identities and powerful configuration were involved. And one of the groups I would like to talk about are the dog catchers. Dog catchers were just regular people. Most cases, men, predominantly poorly educated people. But they were using their role as dog catchers to fight the, to fight the colonial government indirectly. For example, they have the right to walk into any neighborhood. And the argument I made in the book is that by actually quote unquote, stealing or capturing dogs in European neighborhood, the dog catchers were indirectly asserting their own power within the colonial system itself. And I have a lot of evidence to prove this. Some of the evidence include petitions from neighbor, from, uh, from people in Ikoi, European neighborhood, writing petitions to the government and saying that the, God, the dog catchers stole my dog in my nose. The dog catchers came to the yard and stole my dog. Or uh, the dog catchers took my dog and maltreated my dog. And of course, the, the Royal Society for the Prevention of Cruelty to Animals was fighting this in some way. So the argument I would like to make here is that, in as much as we know that much of the debate over urban planning and noise and everything was informed by colonial power outside the capacity of Africans to shape, some Africans occupying significant power, they don't even necessarily have to be elite, the dog catchers were not elite, were using their power to seize dogs, to capture dogs as a form of resistance. And that's the argument I tried to play with and I have evidence to be able to prove, to prove them. Um, some newspaper work on this. Concluding the remarks. So, in, in concluding this uh, presentation, because I would like to, us to have more time to, to ask questions, um, the most important thing I'm trying to engage is that when we talk about series in Africa, we should talk about non-human creatures. That urban planning, urbanization, urban modernity, everything we know about series is not just about humans, but about non-human creatures. And I've tried to use the case of dogs to explain how the movement of bodies at every point in time can be an important element of understanding of normality in terms of engagement not only between dogs and humans, but even amongst, amongst them. But I think this is a project to engage. We have data to be able to do it. It's only that scholars are not looking in that direction. So I would like to see scholarship on, um, on livestock, for example, city livestock. And well, these are the things I did in the book. I have chapters on, on sheep, on goats, and I would actually like to see ways of thinking through the place of, of animals, different kinds of animals, and how their identity and existence intersect with notions of urbanity. So, uh, in, in concluding, I would like to thank um, Dr. Amposa for inviting me. I would like to thank everyone for, for coming. And then the issue, I don't know I took out the beer of Kolamidi. Ujura Bemosa, Baba Tundula. I saw you in the case of Thank you. We have a good amount of time for questions and answers, so feel free to raise your hand there. Without mentioning your name, introduce yourself and then ask your question. Um, I'm Abby. I'm a random PhD student from another department. Uh, I kind of have two questions. Uh, the first one is, you were talking about how this transition that started to happen amongst the African population from viewing their dogs as a utility to a pet. That seems to me like kind of a, a microcosm of what's happened between the relationship between humans and dogs probably throughout human history. And I think different people in modern society have different relationships with their dogs on that front. Like whether you view your dog as a guard dog or just a lap dog. And I was wondering if you can kind of like comment on beyond that case study what 
sort of the implications of that are. And then my second question is just, like, how, how does some of your work, if you've looked at indigenous animals at all, animals that we find in the landscape, um, whether in Africa or in other parts of the world, um, that aren't brought by humans, but what their role is in, or should, or should be in urban studies or understanding our own relationship? Yeah, thank you. Um, should I take one at a time, right? Is that how you want it? Good. So, um, essentially, and there's always transnational or transcultural identities with animals. In other words, some of the issues I've engaged here have cross-cultural implications. You find similar trends. So what I've tried to do, in, in what I did in the manuscript, is to explain the unique structures through which they emerge. So in, even in, you know, in American urban centers, at a particular point in time, there was this tension over what to use your dogs for. But what the transition from uh, utility to pet was part of the signal of being modern. And that's what is unique, what I would think is unique within the context of how Africans began to keep expensive European exotic drug because they think that it is part of what it takes to be modern. So modernity is not just because they have an, a college education, they are doctors, lawyers, they are book keepers, teachers, they drive a car, they live in Yaba, one of the new areas built in the 40s for you know, uh, middle class Africans, some Europeans are also living there. It was also because they thought that they could expand the frontiers of their own urbanity with animals. And that is why I was showing you the poem. I mean, is it a poem like you're writing by a dog? I mean, it's as an African that took his dog to the, to the cinema. And I can, be, I can assure you that taking a dog to the cinema, the cinema itself is a, is a modern space. It's a space of encountering modernity. And thinking that your dog should also encounter modernity. And assuming or thinking that your dog would understand what is going on within the framework of a cinematic, Cinema, cinema, is this cine, 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 cinematic, cinematic uh, experience? So, and that is what is unique for me. It doesn't mean that the, some dogs did not retain their utility role. So, the biggest debate about dog taxation was this dichotomy in which African uh, were hunters were like, you can't tax our dogs because they were useful dogs. You know, pet dogs are useless dogs, they don't have any role. And so the, 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 the idea of pet and utility dog is about spirituality, about using dogs to communicate with the gods. It's economic, it's about the fact that the activities of the dog initiate a chain of uh, other activities. You hunt, you kill the game, you, you sell the game, you hit the game, and it goes on. The pet element about the uh, kind of a companionship, a kind of... And another thing I need to emphasize is that that does not mean that Africans don't have nice relationship with their dogs. You see, it's just like the, the anthropological research that says that, oh, there's no love in Africa. I mean, the Africans don't love because they don't <laughs> kiss, embrace, or shake. They don't show emotions. I mean, I, I, I published an article about romantic love and how some people were saying that, oh, our ancestors don't love our mothers. Because they don't, they don't, they're not good love or something like that. So, so at the end of the day, because it became apparent, it became apparent that it's not about love; it's about how you show love. And that love is not a one size fits all. So the same apply within the context of dogs. Do I? Oh, Africans don't love their dogs. Their dogs roam around on the street. They get killed by cars. A dog should be in the house of the owner. What tells you they don't love their dogs? What tells you they don't know the name of their dog? One of the most fundamental writings about dogs that decolonized the African dog was actually not written by an African. It was written by a, by a cultural enthusiast, now late, called Uli Bayer. The long story about him. He wrote two articles in the 1950s that, deco that decolonized the African dog. In other words, decolonization has been around for many decades anyway. And what he did was to tell us, dude, I have African dogs. The fact that Africans don't pamper dogs the way, and he was a white guy. The fact that Africans don't pamper dogs the way we do it does not mean they don't love their dogs. So what he did was to explain a world of African dog by, from, um, from a white European to, uh, to fellow white European and say, the fact that dogs are eating in some parts of northern, in some parts of middle, uh, middle belt of Nigeria does not mean they don't love their dogs. The fact that they don't pamper their dogs does not mean they don't love their dogs. So the dogs, in other words, dogs can then be a channel through which to engage human existence itself. 
And what Olibaya did in that, in those two articles published in the fifties, is to decolonize the dog. I can continue to talk about this forever, but but the the whole idea of pet and utility, though, for me, as I did in the chapter three of the manuscript, can actually be a way to know so many things about colonialism. And the central argument of the book is that we can't understand colonialism in its full ramification and implication without inserting animals into the logic. When we put animals in the context of colonialism, we see colonialism in a different way. And the question of, I don't, so indigenous animals, so what does that mean? Do you mean the animals that came? I mean, animals, and I'm not sure what's in Lagos, but for example, in Philadelphia there are beavers, or no, not beavers, like wood, woodchucks, oh, wild oh. animals. Oh, okay. I, I'm, we, we, oh, we can. We, there's, there's a way to talk about it. So, in, I think uh, the, the first chapter of the book starts with the story of, uh, they call it ecological imperialism. Uh, you must have heard about it. Ways in which, during colonialism, uh, Europeans brought animals, plants into the colonies. And so, it starts with the story of the importation of two bulls from Britain, from England. And the whole idea was like, African cartoons are not utility cartoons. Right? We want cartoons that can produce a lot of milk, produce a lot of meat, that can move the plow, that can walk, walking cattle. And so they brought two, uh, two, um, two cows, two bulls, but both of them died within a few years because, you know, immune, they were not immune, they don't have immunity to Africa. So we, they say, what we can talk about African indigenous animals and what we can consider as European animals that came through ecological imperialism. One of the arguments again about the book is that during the colonial period, the first decade of the 20th century, African animals, with specific reference to Nigeria, became modern. What does it mean to be a modern animal? A modern cattle, a modern dog, a modern horse. Pre colonial horse was used in fighting wars. The modern horse of the 21st century, 20th century Nigeria was used for pool, was used for horse racing. What does it mean for you to change the symbolic, the social role of animals from the pre-colonial times to? I can, again, I can keep talking about this, but so we can have a discussion about indigenous and, um, and uh, foreign animals. Mm -hmm. But the best way to look at it would be to talk about ecological imperialism, where through which the, the African animal population was diversified as, it was, uh, as a result of the importation of European stock, and this stock itself was, they were importing them because of the notion that they can increase the yield of African animals through exotic breed. And another argument is to say that veterinary, med veterinary medicine in Africa was a capitalist medicine, and that's the argument I made. Uh, it was a medicine that was made, that, was, that came into existence to increase the yield of African animals in order to maximize the gains of capitalism. It was not a benefit, benefit benevolent medicine, if that's the right word to call it. Um, my name is Dorothy. Um, so, when you were saying earlier about um, the role of imperialism and, and you have the pictures of uh, the colonials with their dogs, and I wonder, it reminds me also of this concept, this Tarzan idea that we had uh, in America as well, this idea of um, I, believe, I wonder if you think that it may have also been a way of psychologically subjugating people in the sense that, you know, this idea that they, we are in control of the animals as well. And therefore we are in control of you. And, and so, and then also the taking away of the utility, it's almost, it, it seems to me sort of like this, we take away the wildness and then we can control and this keeps us psychologically at the top keeps us psychologically the master of all beasts. And mm -hmm. even to a degree in America, we have, as I see oftentimes, dogs are treated much better than black people in this country. So I wonder what you would say about that and also this idea that the turning of the utility of the animal impacted the African because it made them less able, less, less facility, less ability to work for themselves. It had an economic, a very direct economic impact on them. And I wonder how much of that you believe was contrived as part of the imperialist agenda. Hey, I mean, I like the word, some of the word you use. We are in control of animals. Yeah. But now this is about conquest, about domination. 
and everything has to be dominated. You mentioned that. And again, one of the contributions of the book is to say, for the first time, that animals were part of the colonial enterprise. They were also part of what was governed. They were subjects. And the governance was based on so many factors. Whether the animals were wild or tamed animals, whether they were beautiful or ugly, the aesthetics, the materiality, the symbolism. And so we know the series we occupy today does the originally don't belong to us. What happened? We have guns, we killed them. So we killed all the animals, we created series. When we create series, sometimes some of the wild animals did what they call uh, rewilding, they come back. When they come back, we kill them because we think the space don't belong to them. This is how to look at the tension of urbanity, the ways in which a place that used to belong to animals, we, we took it from them, we pushed them, and when they came back, we say it does not belong to them. So it's about control and it's about urbanity. And the argument that I was going to, that was making the chapter about white animals, about why do you talk about uh, you cannot kill animals, uh, uh, game laws. The unique thing about game laws is not just because you think that uh, traffic collecting was uh, economically exploitative due to internationalization of it. It's not because animals were fighting back. Animals were finding themselves in new places. Uh, the series we created, the communities we created, I, I, I used a particular uh, saying uh, about urbanization at the beginning. The, that saying is about how African elites converted wastelands into, into cities. That's what they did. And it was at the expense of the natural environment. So, and so why is the lion coming to human community? It's because you have pushed the lion out of its own natural abode. Why, is, why do you see elephants where you're not supposed to see them? So the argument I made in the, in, in, in the chapter of wildlife is that humans were having extensive, sustained relationship with different kinds of animals because these animals were reasserting their own authority. And I use the word agency, and part of this agency is to say that if animals re, re, reinvade, quote unquote, reoccupy mm -hmm. a space that used to belong to them, and that action led to a chain of action, that is a form of agency. If a fox, or if a, if a, if a, not a fox, if, uh, if, uh, if, uh, if a lion is found in a place that does not supposed to be, the question should be asking yourself is what is he doing? What is the lion doing there? So the point, to answer if, if, if I'm getting your question right, the point is to talk about uh, uh, the agency of animals, the capacity of animals to be seen in places that was considered to be unnatural should not be seen as uh, should not be seen as should not be criminalized because the government criminalized it. It should be looked it should be looked from the perspective of what was there before. It was the place it used to be. It came back to reassert. Then you kill the animal. That becomes the way to look at. Okay. So colonialism is about governance and to look at animals as something you can colonize. You can govern. Is what is interesting about the book. And I guess what I'm wondering is do you think also that this was a contrived or an intentional part of the imperialist agenda? Yes, yes. So today, one of the things I found interesting about the book, while writing the book, is that what we think about is not what data is telling us. Um, the colonialism did not think it doesn't have control over animals. Well, I mean, the data is there. I mean, it's not, you know, historians, I mean, no one can manufacture data anymore. We don't, it's what it tells us. The data is categorically telling us that colonialism sees animals as, as creatures to be governed. Uh, the game laws are not just about criminalizing what you can do with animals. It's about, con con it's about environmental conquest. If you can call it economic, uh, ecological, uh, uh, environmental imperialism. Uh, colonialism is not just about humans, it's also about the environment. How do you colonize the place? How do you govern the place? It's about governance. And so what I'm asking for in the manual, what I'm asking, what I'm asking scholars to do in the man in the book is that we should look at colonialism beyond the frame, and we should complicate this agency. It's not just again about Europeans who were colonizing, which was also the ideas of educated elites. For example, there's a, an elite called Obisesson in the battle, and a local elite who believed that if we have modernity, which is cool, then we should have dog taxes. A lot of contradictions. Some African elites believed that dog taxes is nice. Have to run where modern. Why, why would we have a nice city that there will be dog taxes? That is how they do it in Britain anyway. Mm -hmm. So for us to be modern, we should have dog So I really want to complicate everything. I really want to dis, uh, disaggregate and look at the identities of everyone involved, why they were involved. European women, 
wives who are dogs, who are pets, their own understanding of their why were they writing about their pet? Is it because their husbands were not always around, always on tour? And what how did dogs change the gender relations in the colony? Why is that male men? Only one or two colonial officers wrote about his dog. Why is that I have more data about women, white women writing about dogs? That what is the gender implication? So what I'm trying to do is not to it's not to be monolithic in my interpretation of the narrative. It's to look at different animals, their symbolism, their materiality, their location, their engagement with humans, different kinds of humans, city people, urban people, neighborhoods, educated Africans, Africans who are not educated, what do, in terms of Western education this time, what does it mean, what role did the animals play, and how can this help us to understand colonialism in its fullest possible form? Great. Um, so thanks, thanks so much for this, this talk. Um, and I'm curious, uh, my name is Ben, I'm a postdoc in environmental humanities. And the, uh, I feel like the, in environmental humanities, there's an, the interest in kind of decolonial thinking um, or in grappling with something like ecological imperialism and, and all the parts of the, the, the globe would be, you know, to um, there, there is an element of kind of recovery and motivation to understand what the um, paradigm for kind of human and, and animal interaction sort of was in the pre-colonial sense. In part, like I think in part because there is a fantasy that there might be wisdom there or other ways of, just other ways of being an environment that have been kind of obliterated. Um, and uh, that's all to say like I'm curious to hear you say a little bit more about what's knowable and known and knowable about the um, pre-colonial uh, human-dog relationships in in Lagos, what what these dogs were like, and, and I mean, uh, I'm, I'm I'm interested in knowing more about uh, more about these dogs and and their uses and, and that sort of thing. Yeah. And to be slightly obnoxious, uh, I have a second question, which is just whether there's uh, um, any interesting kind of um, uh, connections, overlaps between this work and your work on sexuality. Okay. So, um, the, the, <clears throat> the, the, the data we have for the pre-colonial dogs actually comes more from the anthropological works composed and written in the first half of the 20th century. And so what I did in the portion of that, of the book about the pre-colonial dog is to look at religion is to look at the economic life, to look at areas of indigenous communities where dogs manifest. What we know is that, one, the, the pre-colonial dog was not a monolithic breed. There's this assumption that all African dogs are the same. They're not all the same. But so, one of the ways to look at it is to say that the dog population of Africa changed even before colonialism began. This still may not be that radical. It's not as radical as what happened in the 20th century with sustained importation of European dogs, but it wasn't all the same dogs. The second element, what we know about those predictors, is that they were not always really, they were not fat dogs. And this was another problem Europeans had. Sometimes they see skinny dogs, and it's like, <laughs> mangy looking? It's like, maybe the guy is not supposed to be big. <laughs> <laughs> because we, the reason what we know is that and it, the fact that it looks so quote unquote mangy does not mean it's not worth it. For example, if a hunter again this is another thing I got from Sindra Bay's book on Ogun, I stole it from your book, you know. Mm -hmm. So if you as, as an hunter, if you if your dog helps you to get a gift, the end of the game goes to the dog. So these are dogs that have been well fed eating good games. Anyway. So so but not because they, because they scan, because because they lose skinny does not mean they're not well fed. So what we know about the pre-colonial dog comes predominantly <coughs> from anthropological works. Of course, these are problematic works, we know them already, but there's a way we can sieve out the things that make a lot of sense to us. So the other that it came for me was Samuel Johnson's classic book on the Yoruba, it made a lot of reference to dogs. Because dogs are also a part of economic life. We will see reference to dogs in economic life, exchange, and that was why I said uh, miss of exchange, bright price. Sometimes the authors will just list the bright price, uh, textile, agricultural food, dogs, and then you see dogs. So, so when I was doing my search on this, I used this website 
called uh, archive.org. It's a repository of uh, books that have been dictated, and they all have anthropological works on Nigeria. <laughs> so, but the, the challenge I have, and thanks for that question, is that we don't know as much as we should about the pre-colonial dog, and that's the truth. But the, the section on the pre-colonial dog in the book is just about maybe a thousand words or less. We know more about the colonial dog because of the documentation. And especially, we know more about the colonial history, the dogs of Europeans, because they were writing. Dogs. I mean, we actually can talk about dog mourning culture, how they mourn dogs, and biographical writings about people out there. So, in other, in other words, these are the things we know about the uh, associated dogs. But one thing that I would always like to emphasize is that their breed is not as homogeneous as people claim. We may need extensive science to be able to prove it, but they were diverse. But the physical diversity itself, observable diversity, that took place in the 20th century when we have more European dogs and the crossbreeding was producing unique dogs that everybody can see mm -hmm. and tell apart. Oh, there's uh, two books, sincerely speaking, there's no relationship between the sexuality book and the uh, animal book. But there's a relationship between the book on guns uh -huh. that I did, the one that came out last year, and this one. Uh, the tr uh, because that book has a section on hunting with guns about gaming, and that actually was that overlap. Mm -hmm. So wh while I was writing the book on guns, I was also gathering data on on this book. So the transition from from gun to uh, to animal was much easier from from sex to to guns. Mm -hmm. We have time for just one more quick question. Right, please. Um, my name is Zoya. I'm a veterinary student. Um, so prior to the late 1800s, rabies was the num uh, dogs domestic dogs were the number one contributor to ra rabies. And then in 1885, the vaccine for rabies was invented and essentially being used to eliminate rabies out of domestic dog populations mm -hmm. in Europe. And if uh, Lagos was striving to be more colonialized and more like Britain. Why were dogs being eliminated instead of being vaccinated? Why weren't vaccines being brought in to vaccinate dogs? It was cheaper. <laughs> <laughs> it was cheaper. <laughs> so, the, the, uh, is it uh, the name is, is it Patios, the guy that found the rabies? Louis Pasteur. Pasteur. Something like that. So, it's cheaper. Um, I said that uh, veterinary medicine. Is uh, colonial veterinary medicine was a capitalist medicine. I mentioned that because it was a medicine that was meant to address uh, cattle diseases because cattle was economic asset. No, good. The only other animal species that the government invested on was the, the dog for reasons outlined already, but also because of rabies. So the whole idea is this: um, there is there is uh, there is vaccine. But the problem with the vaccine is that they have to be refrigerated. The problem is that you actually have to administer it. It's not, it's not a vaccine they take once. They have to administer it over time. For, for, and for, for humans, it's also expensive because over weeks. So the question is going, to be, is going to be, you have two options. You have the option of capturing a dog, observing the dog for seven days. When, you, when the dog shows the signs of rabies, which clinical signs like barking, like hiding, hydrophobia, right? Hiding from from lights, you know, then the dog has rabies, he died, he got killed. The question of class and race is simple. If the dog belongs to an African, an educated African, the, the owner would pay for the government to observe the dog for two, three weeks. If the dog belongs to a poor African, the owner does not have the money to pay because the dog has to be fed while you observe it. So then you have the option of saying that every dog captured on the street, in certain neighborhoods that have been designed and uh, classified as rabid because of the large size of the neighborhood, which also means they have a lot of dogs and the dogs are causing too much problems. Mm -hmm. Then once you capture them, kill them. And that is why your question is important. It allows me to go back to, the, to especially some of the points I was making. So the, the control over rabies itself was essentially about urban planning, about class. But if the dog belongs to a colonial officer, he can extend his authority on the dog and say, one, uh, this is money, observe this dog for seven days. The law says observe the dog for seven days, but rich people can get away with whatever they like. You can observe for two months until you, are, you, have to, you, you know it's free. But 
Second, even if the dog is rabid, as long as the dog is not caught outside. And African dogs are not supposed to be outside anyway. They are guard dogs. They are, you know, so in other words, then so it means that the chances that a dog of an elite African medical doctor like Oluwole will be caught and killed, the chances is low because the dog is going to be in the park, even if the dog is rabid. But the dog on the street, even if not rabid, will be captured and killed. So the rabies vaccine, and another point, rabies vaccine was 10 cents per dose. In 1920s and 30s, it was a lot. Mm -hmm. One of the things I argument I made in the book is that there was a time the colonial government was asked to produce those vaccines in large quantity in Nigeria. But the, the vet, the, both the vet and the MOH, the medical, the, the human medical part, thought that why do you want to be invested in animals when humans don't have enough? Malaria is a problem. Malaria is the number one problem of Lagos. So you want to have a laboratory to produce the uh, uh, rabies vaccine when humans don't have, If you have rabies, why don't you kill the animal? So even up to the 1950s, Europeans who, have, who, are, who, are, who are beaten by dogs have to go to Senegal. There's a place called Patches Institute in Senegal. And that was the only place where they could treat rabies for Europeans. For Africans, it means that if you're caught by me, you got beaten, you're very lucky, you're back for a few days and you die. So, <laughs> even, so in Nigeria, that's just what will happen. So, and one of the arguments I made in the book is that rabies, the problem with rabies, it's not the number of people it killed, it's the anxiety it caused. And there's no disease in the 20th century Nigeria and in most parts of Africa that caused anxiety as rabies. And that was why on the eve of the Queen's visit to Nigeria in 1956, a new form of urban governance of dogs took place. Dogs were captured day and night. The problem is simple. The anxiety over rabies can ruin two million dollars, two million pounds worth of investment. The spectacle itself cost Nigeria two million pounds. And so when they say someone is rabid, rabies it was like Ebola. It, that was how they saw rabies. Once, once you hear this, a rabies, and of course we know the clinical symptoms. If a dog behaves strongly, that's the end of the dog. Like, he's barking, he's fighting people, he's hiding. And so the whole idea of, and the problem with rabies was not just because, was because it empowered people, regular people, the capacity to name diseases. See, the only way, the only way you can know the dog is, is truly rabid is it dies, you cut the air, they send it to the lab, they test the air. But the problem with rabies is it empowered non-medical interpretation of etiology and epidemiology of the disease. And that was why the story of rabies, especially in the city, should be of interest to scholars. But well, it's a good question about veterinary medicine. Yeah, it's because they don't want to invent it. They have to kill a dog. After you can breathe another one anyway, so. <laughs> <laughs> another reason is because uh, most dogs cost, most African dogs cost five sh shillings. The, the, the vaccine is 10 shillings. So when you ask, and, and the, 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 the vaccination was, so if you have seven dogs, it means seven, 70 shillings. That's going to almost a pound. That's a lot of money. But, and, and so the, the only, and, and there's this thing they call, um, the, the, you, have to put the, you have to put your vaccination record on your, on, your, on your hood. It was a big deal. And so there's a lot of things going on during this period. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so there's some light refreshment, uh, Nesro, so you can just um, grab something.